Okay, the quizzes today is very, 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 very easy. Very easy. City of Peace. Very good. All right. <laughs> wow. Before even asking the question. <laughs> Have you gotten one of these before? No? Okay. It's an MP3. Okay. So Jerusalem is the city of peace. Isn't it? just uh, very weird that it is the city that's always has been always out of peace and like there is no peace in this even though in, in the psalm we pray and we say pray for the peace of Jerusalem of course because it needs a prayer but also uh, why do we why do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Huh? It represents us exactly. It represents the church. So that's why in the liturgy we say, pray for the peace. Exactly. Pray for the peace of the one only holy Catholic. We, we don't pray for the, the strength of the church. We don't pray for the, uh, 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 the mission of the church. We pray for the peace of the church. Okay? Because it's exactly what was said. I just want to show you how the liturgy is really, 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 really biblical. Is when it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, then when we pray, we say, pray for the peace of the, the one only Holy Catholic and Orthodox Church. Okay? Because it was said exactly, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That was actually in Psalm uh, 122. You know, where also we pray something in the liturgy and, and we don't know that it's biblical to pray for it. When you pray for the de the hegumens, the deacons, the priests, and, and all of this. Why? Because Jesus said, pray. Uh, I'm sorry. When we pray for the, the hegumens, the priests, the deacons, we say, those who help the Pope, those who divide the, the, word of, the word of truth with him, with the Pope, those who divide the word of truth, grant them unto your holy church. Grant them. Bring them. Okay, all those servants who are helping and guiding the church, bring them. Okay, so that's because Jesus said, "Pray the Lord of the harvest to, to send laborers to His harvest." So almost everything we pray in for the liturgy, it's like something in the Psalms. Anyways, so we don't pray for the peace of London or New York or Rome. Because Jerusalem is the city of God, or as I said, it is the church. Okay, in the past chapters, we stopped, actually we're, we're going here to start from chapter 28. We've done uh, um, many chapters before, like prophecies in, in Isaiah about the future of, of Jerusalem, uh, Judea, uh, the future of, of like the, the countries around and today, God is going to warn Jerusalem about something bad that's going to happen to them. He's actually going to give them five woes, okay? Five woes in, in the next couple of chapters. Hopefully, you can cover from chapter 28 to 31, okay? So the first part, if you have your Bible, you open Isaiah 28, okay? And that starts by a warning. The Lord warned Jerusalem. And God is sending that by the prophet Isaiah. He loved Jerusalem. He loved the city. The place, the, the place of the temple. The place of God's dwelling. Jerusalem is called the city of God. And it's called the city of David. Even heaven is called the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay? So Jerusalem really is, is the presence of God. Where God is present. So... The, uh, Isaiah saw that there is destruction coming to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem were dis destroyed at a certain point. There was two warnings or two events, two main events that happened. Once when the king of Assyria came, came from the north, destroyed the northern kingdom completely, Samaria. And we're going to talk about that now. He destroyed Samaria. And he destroyed parts of Judea that's around Jerusalem. And right at the gate of Jerusalem, before conquering Jerusalem, 
God did the biggest miracle ever in Old Testament right after crossing the Red Sea, which is killing the king and 185,000 soldiers without war. God just killed them completely without any war. Okay? That's going to be explained very, very well in chapter... It's okay, don't worry. It's going to be explained in chapter 37. Okay? But these are the warnings before these things happen. So Jerusalem was that close to be destroyed, but God saved it right at the gate. Okay? And almost 150 years after that, Jerusalem were destroyed by the Babylonians because they didn't listen to God. So now the warning is, watch out. There is a storm coming. This storm is going to destroy the northern kingdom, and you guys are next. When you see something bad happening to your neighbor, when you see something bad happening around you, just think about it. Maybe this is a warning from God to you. Okay? So, here is in, in, in the beginning of chapter 28, where it says, Woe to the crown of pride, the tr drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valleys, to those who are overcome with wine. Do you understand anything? Not a thing? Okay. Ephraim is the northern kingdom, actually. It's exactly the, the southern, where they call them Judah. Even though they're J Judah and Benjamin, they call them Judah. And the northern one, even though it's called Samaria, or Israel, sometimes it's Samaria, sometimes it's Israel, or sometimes it's Ephraim. And he's saying, what to the, the, the crown of pride? Why the crown of pride? Samaria was actually a city on top of a hill. Okay? So the city was big, huge walls. And when you look from far, you look at the city, and then the entire hill, the valley, is actually with, with all green and flowers and things like this. So it's exactly as, as you know, something really looking nice, and there is a crown on top of it. Okay? But God called that crown of pride. And because their city was in a hell like this, they said, no one can ever penetrate our city. But of course, that did not happen. And the king of Assyria destroyed that, that city. Apparently, uh, one of the worst problems they had is the problem of drinking. Drinking. That's why he calls, like he talks a lot about the drunkards of Ephraim. Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. All these walls, all this glory, is just fading flowers. Flowers that come for one day or another, and then it goes away. Which is at the head of the Verdant Valley to those who are overcome with wine. Because these people were overcome with wine. They were drinking too much. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and a strong one, like a tempest of hail, a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand. What is this tempest? What is this storm? What kind of storm? storm that God is sending to Ephraim king of Assyria and his soldiers do you know what is what like what what army is 185,000 soldiers you know how if you spread these people how do you do look, look like so they are a storm coming completely destroying that city and God called this as a storm Remember the Gulf War? They called it what? Desert Storm. Right? Desert Storm. So, same. And then in verse 3, verse three he says, The crown of pride, again because the city was on top of a hill, again crown, the crown of pride, the drunkard of Ephraim, will be trampled underfoot. And that day the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and 
a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. Are you taking glory of your city? Who exactly said the same word to God? Look at the temple. Look at the beauty of the temple. What did Jesus say? I tell you, not a stone will, will stay upon another stone. Because their pride was not in God but in the beauty and in the strength of that city. Regardless what we take pride of, no one should, be, should have any glory except the glory of God. Basically, if you have everything in life and you don't have Him, you're poor and you don't have anything. But if you have Him, He is the crown of your glory. And of course, we're not going to talk much about the crown of glory, but the crown of glory has a lot of meanings. Okay, crown of glory has a lot of meanings, but maybe later on we can talk about that. So the neighbors were destroyed, and next to them were Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was supposed to take, like, to take a lesson from that. If my best friend, or if it's my friend or my cousin, faces a problem and he's in trouble, I definitely should, should take a lesson. Whenever something happens in front of me, it is a message by God. And the destruction of Ephraim was mainly a message to do Jerusalem, so they don't fall. And of course, they didn't listen, and they, 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 they did fall. Their main problem here, and if you read the, the rest of the chapter, that these people were drunk a lot. This city, the city was like, like really plagued with drinking. You know what, what, what's the city that's, uh, that's really plagued with drinking a lot? Washington, D.C. Do you know that? Some people were actually making fun of that. There in Washington, we have three parties. We have the Democratic Party, we have the Republican Party, and we have the Cocktail Party. <laughs> so that's how much drinking in Washington. Washington has more drinking than a lot of cities. And unfortunately, it's the city that controls the nation. <laughs> Isn't that sad? And actually, in, uh, I, I have like a saying from one of the one of the religious leaders but it was late it was early on in, in 1989 he said alcohol and nicotine kill 450,000 people annually while illegal drugs kill about 6,000 people alcohol and nicotine kills almost half a million people annually versus illegal drugs kills, you know, 6,000 people. People don't know these facts. And <clears throat> even though it was not forbidden to drink completely in the Old Testament, but it was forbidden to get drunk and to be, and to get yourself into being drunk. And of course, there is many woes in the Bible to anyone who gets drunk thing is, anyone who drinks has a chance and, 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 and is vulnerable to get drunk. And God says, if you, if you ever get drunk, you know, woe to you. And the book of Isaiah spoke a lot about this. Woe to, 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 to those who are given to, to drinking. Because people lose completely their mind. Actually, I didn't get you... Uh, oh, yeah, I have this verse here. Um from the book of Ephesians where it says and do not be drunk with wine in which, dissip dissip in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit you understand this verse meaning instead of just because the, the, the drinks is like make someone feel good okay make some, someone feel you know um not really feeling the pain. 
He said, why don't you be filled with the Spirit even that you are drunk? Drunk with, with God's love. Drunk with God's presence. Drunk with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be, do not be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. Of course, people rejoiced in Judah because of the fall of Samaria. But Isaiah announced to them the bad news that they are going to be next. And, you know, they, they are under the same judgment. In verse 7 he says, But they also, the people in, uh, in, in Judah, have erred through wine. Again, they have the same problem. And through intoxicating drink, are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. Basically, the people are living in, in, in the filthness of drinking. You know what drinking also... Uh, means doesn't mean only just the, the the strong drink what does it mean what did jesus say about something almost like drinking anyone remember jesus said something that's almost like drinking it's the busyness of life when he said about the the coming day that don't be uh, uh, get drunkard with the with the busyness of life with what's going on and I see a lot of people almost drunk they think it's in a good way they think it's in a nice way they don't feel anything and they feel high only because of doing so many things and having certain you know uh, interaction and stamina in their lives it's almost like drinking it's like exactly like being workaholic what's workaholic it's like it's like alcoholic it's someone who is drunk but by something else but another substance i'm sorry i didn't get you this verse that jesus said but he exactly said that, that don't be drunk with the busyness uh, of of this life so he was, he was telling them, even the priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. Even the leaders of the people. And that actually means something very important. If the people, the entire people in the whole world, they are drunk, whether by drink or by busyness, certain people should never be like in the Old Testament, yeah, people may drink. But there are some people who were forbidden from drinking completely in the Old Testament. Who are they? Prophets. The priests. Why? And the king, actually. You know that? That the king were not supposed to drink. Why? Because one word from him affects hundreds and, and thousands and millions of people so in the Old Testament God put strict rules upon them because the priest cannot be drunk and the prophet and the king they, there, is like, there is no way, there is no chance for them who are the priests of the New Testament and who are the kings of the New Testament who are they Christians, all of us the light of the world we're supposed to be light we're supposed to be what did Jesus always say Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Mean, be very, very, very awake. Not just awake um, that, that do, do not drink. But, you know, you can never get too busy. And you can never lose the focus. And you can never lose track. Christian can never be workaholic. Or alcoholic. Or given in to any drink. Not even drink. Same way the priests and the king in the Old Testament 
they were not supposed to drink. Same thing every, every, every Christian. Even though it was not written in the Bible clearly that Christians should never touch a drink. Because that's, that's not the language of the New Testament. No, New Testament never spoke like this. Never spoke about what to eat and what not to eat and what to drink, what not to drink. But be filled with the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Be light to the world and salt to the earth. Or else, who's going to be in trouble? The whole world. If Christians are drunk, the whole world is in trouble. The whole world. Is the whole world in trouble these days? Yes. Why? Because Christians are drunk. They're not sober. They're not awake. They're drunk with whatever kind of drink it, 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 it should be. But Christians, they should give wisdom to the world. They should give understanding. They should give love. They should give hope. Can never be drunk. Can never lose vision. That's why it says here, the err in vision, they stumble in judgment. The err in vision, they stumble in judgment. That, that can't be for for us Christian prophets and kings and, 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 uh, and priests. Not only that, but even these prophets, they mocked God's judgment and they mocked Isaiah when he spoke to them. <clears throat> what did they say? How many they were, they were mocking against like uh, Isaiah and they said, whom will teach, whom will he, about Isaiah, teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk? Like, is he teaching us like little kids? Those just drawn from the breasts? Are we like little kids? For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little, there a little. You understand what they mean? You know, tata tata in Arabic? You know? taking a step by step, little by little, precept upon precept. What is this? Are we little kids? Is he giving us simple message? They were making fun of him. And a lot of people these days, they're making fun of Christians as what, what are these simple messages that they are delivering? Exactly like St. Paul. What is, this is foolish, foolishness. The cross is foolishness. Exactly the same thing they're saying. What is this? Do we need to hear that? Of course they're drunk. Cannot understand. You know who also is drunk and cannot understand? A busy person. Workaholic is the best word. Let a workaholic come to church. And let him hear a message. No matter how simple the message is. Ask him in the end. What did you get out of it? He said very simple stuff like this is like a Sunday school lesson. Okay, it's a Sunday school lesson. What did you get out of the Sunday school lesson? If you're a little kid, you should have gotten something. Did you? But no, it's just silly stuff. Why? Because he's not awake, he's not sober. The mind and the heart is just too busy with, with something else. Drunk. You know this Japanese pro proverb that says, first the man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink thinks, takes the man. First the man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. That's exactly what it is. Whether it's on drinking or uh, uh, being workaholic, it's, you know, as I said, they're, they're almost the same. What's Isaiah's message to them in verse 11? For with the stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to, his, to this people. Do you understand what that means? For with the stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. Basically, if they don't understand the simple message, he's going to speak to them another language. What is it? Something harsh. Punch in the face problem, trial, something to make someone wake up. You know when someone gets in trouble and say, oh this is a wake up call? You were not awake? No, I was not awake. 
So he said, if you didn't listen to the word, something, another language he will speak. The word of the Lord was, a, was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a, li- here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. It's their, their, their fault. What happened to the Jews? As I said, God warned them through the fall of Samaria. But 150 years after that, the Babylonians came and they destroyed Jerusalem completely with the temple and they took the people slaves because they didn't listen to the warnings of the Lord. And that led Isaiah to his another message or another announcement. God is trying to give rest to the people, but they refuse. Therefore, hear the word of the, the hear the word of the Lord, you scornful uh, scornful men, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol, we are in argument in agreement when the overflowing scourge pass through it will not come to us for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves basically they said nothing is going to happen to us why? because we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol what's death and Sheol? huh? It is, a, it is a grave. It is a graveyard. Basically, they made covenant or treaty with two countries, with Egypt and Babylon. So Jerusalem, when they saw Samaria getting in trouble, and instead of really holding on to God, they said, let us protect ourselves, lest nothing bad happen to us. Let's make like a make friendship with these two countries, and nothing will happen to us. Let Assyria come. Let anyone come. We have like back support. They will take care of us. And God called the Egypt and Bab- Babylon. Called them death and grave. As you saw right here. Basically. You will be given to death. Basically if you rely on anything other than God. Then you are making agreement with death not agreement to live and not agreement with peace and not agreement with someone can help you but agreement with death therefore thus says the Lord behold I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation a tried stone a precious corner stone a sure foundation whoever believes will not act hastily what is this stone what is this foundation what is the stone in the Old Testament? Always. Christ is the stone. Basically, if, if you... And, 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 and Jesus was called like the, 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 the stone or the rock of the ages. That anyone will trust upon him will never fail. I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. And you know that Jesus called the cornerstone that the builders rejected. Basically... This should be your back support. This is what you should depend on. For the bed is too short to stretch out on, and a covering so narrow that cannot wrap himself in it. Basically, what you're trying to cover yourself with, these countries, they're not going to help you. Their bed is too short, and the, the, the cover cannot even cover you completely. Only God can cover you. Only him can support. And then Isaiah's final announcement here. For the Lord will rise up as a Mount Perazim he will be angry as the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work, his awesome work, 
and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. What is this act? Basically, the Jerusalem, they heard that the king of Assyria they're com is coming, trying to protect themselves, try to depend on other countries. But here the Lord is doing an unusual act. What is this unusual act? As I said, when he will completely destroy the king of Assyria in one night. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin, but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground, therefore he does not thresh it forever, break it with his cartwheel or crush it with his horsemen. I know you don't understand anything of that, but what it means <laughs> is there is a way of dealing with, with each, each harvest. There is a way to take care of the cumin, okay? When you get the cumin, of course, you've never seen cumin before. You don't know how to make it, but there is a way to make it. You have to crush it very well, take the cover out, and then, you know, make it like... There is a way to do the cumin, okay? It needs like a cooking uh, uh, session for that. And there is another way to deal with the bread. In order to make bread, this is the, the different way deal with the corn or the wheat is different than you deal with the cumin. Basically, the Lord knows exactly what to do. Because these seeds usually beat them up. You beat them until like you make them powder. So God has a way to beat up every single person. He has a rod for everyone. Okay? This also comes from the Lord of hosts who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. I said all this cumin and things like this. So when I say this word, you know exactly what I mean. Because sometimes, okay, it's easily. Yeah, the Lord, wonderful in counsel and in excellent guidance. No, he really knows what he's doing. And he knows how to treat everything. He knows how to treat the enemy. Egypt cannot help us. And Babylon cannot help us. They don't know how to deal with this situation. But he knows how to deal with everything different way. And then the second message in the same chapter, uh, sorry, in, in chapter 29, the Lord humbles Jerusalem. When they don't hear the word of the Lord, then God humbles them. How? He says here, Wo to Ariel, or Ariel, Ariel, the city where David dwelt, add year to year, lest feasts come around. Ariel, actually, he means Jerusalem with it. You know what Ariel is? Is actually when you burn something, when they burn the, the, the burned offerings, the, the dust that comes after the burning, that is its name, Ariel. This Ariel is, is the dust of something that's burned. So God is calling Jerusalem and everything in it the dust of the altar. Basically, I will make you a sacrifice. I will make everything in this city be burned up completely and be like dust. But he, he says, the city where David dwelt, add year to year, let feasts come around. What does that mean? People celebrate feasts. People come to Jerusalem year after year. But no, no fruits, nothing. He said, I'm going to burn all of this. It's useless. Year come after year, feast after year, feast. Lent after Lent, holy week after holy week, and nothing changes. He said, I hate that. I can't take that anymore. Yet I will distress Ariel. They shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be shall be to me as Ariel, like I make them dust. I will encamp against you all around. I will lay siege against you with a mound, and I will raise siege works against you. You shall be brought down. You shall speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be low out of the dust. 
basically because you didn't listen I am going to punish you what is the punishment as I said by the exile that was going to happen verse 5 he says moreover the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust yani God will punish their enemy and the multitude of the terrible ones like chaff that passes away yet it shall be in an instant suddenly actually Isaiah prophesied about the destruction of of Assyria suddenly <clears throat> you will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and great noise with a storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire so I can't stand so and here God says the real problem here in verse 13 in chapter 29 he says and actually Jesus caught, quoted the same verse exactly Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Jesus said that exactly. They worship, there is altar, they go, they come from year to year, but nothing comes from the heart. Just the worship of men commandment of men not the commandment of God and in verse 15 he says woe to those who seek deep hide their counsel far from the Lord and their works are in dark they say who sees us and who knows us surely you have things <coughs> turned around shall the potter be steamed as the clay for shall the things made say of him who made it he did not make us or shall the thing form it say of him who formed it he has no understanding basically saying how can the pot that the, that the pottery did can say to the pottery how can the thing that is made, the clay, say to its master, Why, what are you doing? What do you understand? What do you know about what I'm doing? And God actually will try to make up things with them. And he's trying to tell them basically, why do you depend on things? And I'm here with you. And I'm for you. Why do you leave me and depend on Egypt and Babylon? These things really, really, really upset God when we depend on anything other than Him. As little as it is, or as much as it doesn't sound really bad, but it is really bad in the eyes of God. Basically, that I, that I, as if I don't exist. As if I mean nothing to you. That's why there is a verse that says, without faith, you 
you cannot dotted line him without faith you cannot please him sorry I don't have it up there but without faith without trusting in him maybe sometimes you confess this as a oh lack of faith don't really depend on God you know what is the worst sin is like uh, uh, the sorcery witchcrafting why because it's it's still in God I'm sorry you cannot help me I'll see someone else is stronger to help me that's what God feels when we do not depend on him when we really take things on on our own but he comes back and encourages them a little bit in verse 17 it's not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest like in no time God can make a, a fruitful field and a forest out of nothing he cannot he can help and he can raise the people up in that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. God will give them light to see. God will give understanding to his people. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob will not be ashamed, nor shall he come nor shall his face now grow pale but when he sees his children the work of my hands in his midst they will hallow me and hallow the holy one of Jacob and fear the God of Israel God will make them fear him basically that's what it says these also who erred in spirit will come to understanding and those who complained will learn doctrine Basically, God is saying there is light in the future. That he will never leave the people like this. The faithfulness of God can never leave his people in darkness. Even when they don't depend on him. He will punish them. Not punish them, but discipline them. He will show them. You know the difference between a lot of work that's done by God and through God and a lot of work that's done by our own ability and depending on our own hands always give this difference is efficient versus effective what's efficient? efficient I can do a lot of things shorter time or in the same time I can do much 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 more and I like that day when I cross out a lot of to-do things did that, did this, finished that there are a lot of work that I wanted to do but is it really effective? did it really make the goal? is, is this really what God wants me to do? or it's a day that's wasted out of my life and I'm just not aware of that that's exactly what it is when the Lord is not present in that and then God rebukes Jerusalem in chapter 30 that's the fourth woe he rebukes them for the rebellion woe to the rebellious children says the Lord who takes counsel but not of me who devise plans but not of my spirit that they may add sign to sign they just want to look great so they take device take plans make everything but not of my spirit not guided by God by their own counsel 
if you really meditate on, on this verse, verse 1, you don't see like it's, it's not too bad. What did they do? They just made plans. They said, this plan doesn't have me. I'm out of this picture. And he's telling them, woe to the rebellious children. Verse 2, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice. You see this? Going to take the help of Egypt without taking the advice of the Lord. How important is it to really pray and take God's counsel before anything we do? Why? As I said, when you do it through the guidance of the Spirit, when, when the work is done by God, maybe it's not efficient. Maybe it's not fast. Maybe in the entire day you do one thing, but you do it according to God's will. You do something that would last. You could do, I don't know if you've ever tried that. Have you ever tried to wake up and you have a lot of stuff to do and like you, you have no minute to waste and then you decide not to pray that day because you have a lot of stuff and please God forgive me and I really know that I need to pray and all of this and and but I, I can't. I have a lot of things to do. And you do everything. And everything. You do a lot of things. And in the end, everything that was done is useless. Spend five hours at the mechanic shop. Finish the car. It's nice. It's clean. You drive. Same thing happens. Same sound the same light check engine, same problem after wasting the entire day. And then like you went ahead and did something, took more, a couple more hours, same, nothing, like uh, it's not of any use. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and the trust of the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. Basically, trust in them as much as you want. Gonna be humiliation and waste of time for you. Okay, so let's actually jump to chapter 31, because 31 actually is the conclusion of these messages all together okay so that's 31 right okay chapter 31 actually like summarizes everything that he said in the past like uh, was or three was but in in a summary and in a very very nice way explains everything who to those who go down to Egypt for help any rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong but do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. No one can ever reach God without faith. Before trusting that His power is more strong than anything I can do. That He can really help me more than the doctors and more than the lawyers and more than the friends and more than the money and more than the support. Anyone who doesn't do that will be ashamed in the end. That's what it means. Number one, nothing good will happen. Number two, you will waste a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money. People do that. Think, okay, maybe, yeah, I wasted, maybe I wasted like a day or two or a year or two without God. Really, that's, that's not just it. You lost a lot of things away from Him. There is no gain whatsoever without Him and without trusting in Him. Yet He also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back His words 
but will arise against the horse of evil doers and against the help of those who work iniquity. God will not be quiet. He will punish that. Why? So the meek people will learn. Good people will learn. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretched out his hand, both he who helps will fail and he who is helped will fall down. They all will perish together. Those who help and those who get help, both of them will perish because God is out of the equation. It will never be a win situation whatsoever. It will be a lose-lose situation for everyone. That's what people don't understand. When they don't rely on Him, really have faith and trust in Him. In verse 5, Like birds flying about, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, He will also deliver it. Passing over, He will preserve it. God will take care of it as a bird going and really having an eye return to him again as whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted for in that day every man shall throw away his idols of silver and his idols of gold sin which your own hands have made for yourselves then Assyria shall fall by a sword not of man and a sword not of mankind shall devour him basically a huge miracle will happen 185,000 soldiers will die not with the sword of man but by just one word from God things will happen in a different way in a way we can never ever ever imagine but that takes what? Takes faith. Hezekiah, the king, did that. He set the armies around Jerusalem. And we will, we, we will study that in more depth. 185,000 soldiers around the gates of Jerusalem, right outside the walls. What do we do? The entire people in Jerusalem, they're not even a hundred thousand people how will they fight have nothing to fight with and if these people just surround Jerusalem no food or water will come in and out and people will just die Hezekiah went inside the temple really humbled himself fasted, pleaded, cried to God him and the leaders of, 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 of the people why? We depend on you. We know that you can save. You saved our fathers before. You split the Red Sea. And as I said, God did an amazing miracle that no one could have ever imagined. Destroyed the entire army overnight with the angel of God. Not a, not a single man fought. Why? They depended on him. Relied on him. That he is real. That I, that, that I trust in him. You can do it. Everything that we do in this pleasure to God. Depending on ourselves. Depending on our strength. Basically telling God. You cannot help me. Let me help myself. Or let something else help me. And that's really, really disappointment to the Lord. And at that, at that point he says. You know what? I, I, I will leave you for a little bit till I just show you how weak you are. Faith is, is, is a life that, that lives without calculations. Really depends on him. Doesn't mean that I shouldn't do my part. Do my part. Can never, ever, ever take him out of the picture, out of the equation. No matter what it what it entails but I will always trust in him and I will always depend on him any question ok hopefully soon we're getting into the meat 
this as I said we're still on the shore of Isaiah real Isaiah starts at chapter 40 we're in 31 so we're getting uh, we're getting closer okay I know this is a little bit dry but um, you know the the reason why I'm covering that is is you know anyone who studies and wants really to to know what's in this book because there is there is gold that's hidden in there so actually there is a very very nice verse that I skipped that I want you to meditate on in Isaiah 30 chapter 15 Isaiah 30 chapter verse 15 for thus says the Lord God the Holy One of Israel in returning and rest you shall be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength but you would not returning to me resting it's again is the whole workaholic things that we're, we've been talking about that how you shall be saved I'll just leave this verse with you because it's a beautiful verse that we didn't have time to meditate on okay let's stand up for prayer In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you because you are our fortress, Lord. There is nothing more beautiful, Lord, than your promise that you will take care of us, Lord. Always promised, Lord, that you will take care of all of our needs, that you will do what's best for us, Lord, if we just trust you, if we just follow you. Lord, we know our human nature always want to trust our own will, our own abilities. And we want to trust what we see. But faith is trusting what we cannot see. Trusting your power, Lord. Trusting that you are you are stronger than all the armies of the world, Lord. And even if the whole world is against us, Lord, and you are with us, we are winning, Lord, and we are more conquerors through you and through your grace. We thank you, praise you, glorify you, Lord, for this message. We ask that you give us more and more faith to depend on you and to trust you, Lord, day after day. Through our prayers, intercession of our Holy Mother, St. Mary, St. Mark, and all your saints, hear us, Lord, when we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespass against Lead us not temptations, but deliver us from evil one. For Christ Jesus our Lord, for in the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may depart in peace. May the peace of God be with you all.